Welcome everybody to physics, AP physics today. Um, just a little note about yesterday's. Yesterday's, uh, we talked about the car and it was kind of a so-so video. But what I decided which would be better, if these guys are going 50 and 50, then you could actually treat it. So it, it cleans up the math a little bit. Treat it as a relative velocity of one car going 100. Because that is the relative velocity. You could treat it that way and then, you know, it'd be a little bit easier to do without thinking about the absolute value of the momentum change. And so maybe Mythbusters might want to do that. Maybe they would put one car with zero velocity and one with 100 velocity and then they could check to see if they get the same results as one car with 50 meters per second velocity. I think that would be a good little thing. Maybe we could ask them to do that for us. It's not really a myth though, so probably not. Okay, so rocket inch is an impulse. So we're talking today about impulse, which is force delta t is change in momentum or change in velocity. Okay, so when we're talking rockets, this impulse which is given with all rocket engines is the total change in the momentum. Now, the way we're going to be talking about it today is going to look like this. Force time, this is going to be the look of our graph. But in reality, a rocket's graph looks like this. The impulse goes like this, and then depending on the rocket, it'll level out like that, or some of them go like this, or some of them go like this. So there's not a constant force times time, but that's the way we're going to be looking at it. That's the way we're going to do the math today. Okay, so let's just say here that we have... Um, well, let's look at what we have here. So when you do these problems, you're going to get a list of engines, and you'll get a total impulse, and it'll tell you burn time. Okay, so looking at our list, we noticed that we had these SD's D12 engines, and they have an impulse of 17 newton seconds. Okay, and a burn time of 1.7 seconds. And then this is just kind of what we were talking about. So it says uh, a 0.4 kilogram rocket experiences a thrust of two SDC D12 engines. What's the rocket's velocity after the engines burn out? Okay, so to check that out, okay, so here's our rocket. It's a 0.4 kilogram rocket or we could call it a 4 Newton rocket. Um, and then these are the D12s, they're going to fire out at the same time. So we want to figure out, so the thing is going to go and once you don't hear the rockets burn anymore, that's the end of the burn time, that's where we're trying, that's where the final change in momentum is. That's what we're going to try to figure out here. Now keep in mind, this is going to be without air. So the velocity that we have then is going to be, what do you think, greater or less than, av than actual? Okay, so where's the momentum then? Because if there's a conservation of momentum and we're changing momentum with this impulse, where is it if it's not in the rocket? In the air particles, very good. Yep, the air particles are moving faster. Okay, so the first thing you want to do here, or... You can do a couple different things, but if we just go force delta T equals J equals M delta V, then we can see that we already have a J. We have uh, 17 Newton seconds, and that equals M delta V. Okay, now, there's a problem with this though, because this would be a total change of momentum if there was no other force 
happening here, right? Because I can have a rocket that goes, shoots out the bottom and it doesn't even go off the path. I can also have a rocket that just makes the, or an engine that just makes the rocket float there. So we have to remember that we're fighting against one of the force, gravity. So we can't just do a straight flat out, hey, this is gonna be our velocity at the end because we have to figure about our, what else is impulsing this rocket? What else is doing a force for an amount of time besides the engine thrust? Gravity. So there's a, so we could look at it a couple different ways. We have an impulse of the rocket plus an impulse of the earth is going to equal our, you know, summation of impulses. So we could do it a couple different ways. We could say, you know, 17 plus, okay, the earth is going to be impulsing with what force? Four newtons and over how much time? 1.7 seconds, right? It's going to be the same burn as the burn time, right? But this is not a plus. This is actually a, a minus, isn't it? So it's 17 then minus 6.8 equals the total impulse or the summation of impulses if I did that math right, okay? So then I could say that my J is now you know, 10.2, and that impulse then is equal to this mass delta V. So you divide, you divide both sides by mass, and you'll get your change of velocity. If you start on the, on the ground, then it's going to be zero for your initial, so your change of velocity is going to be equal to your final velocity. So 10.2 divided by 0.4 is what for velocity? 25.5 meters per second. Now, that would be if we just have one D12, right? But we actually have two, so that really changes this. So it's going to be two times 17, or 34. And then our summation of impulses, then instead, is going to be 34 minus 6.8 is going to be 27.2 and divide that by 0.4 so our actual final velocity is going to be 68 meters per second. Thank you very much for catching that. Okay, does that make sense? There's another way to look at this too. I mean, it's all going to be the same math, but there's going to be another way to look at it. So another way we could look at this is say, you know, our total impulse is the summation of forces over a period of time equals mass times delta V. And if we think of our summation of forces in this case, what is the force of the engines? Well, if J is equal to force times time, and in this case is equal to 17, and our time is given as 1.7, then the force of each engine is going to be 10 newtons, right? Any questions about that? You have to know how to do this both ways. Okay, so the total force of two engines then, so if we had two, then we equal a 20 newton force that's coming out of the engines. But the problem with that is there's also something else forcing too, right? So my summation of forces then is going to be 20 minus the force of gravity. So our total, our total summation of forces is 16 newtons that will actually be used to change this momentum. Because we've canceled out gravity at that point. Any questions about that? Okay, so we have 16 newtons. So let's look at this now, what we do next. Um, to find our summation of impulses then, it's gonna be 16 newtons times 1.7 seconds Okay, so our total impulse then is 27.2 
newton seconds, and that's going to equal my mass times delta V. So my V in this case is divided by 4. My V should be 68. Is that what we had before? Okay, so we didn't screw up any of the math, which it should be the same either way, right? Okay, so that's how you do the rocket and the impulse questions. Okay, just to kind of remind you about what happens in real life is the force of any fluid, friction, and the velocity in the fluid, so fluid is liquids or gases, is like this. It's exponential. The faster you go, the much more frictional force you have. So, you know, th these velocities aren't actually true. So what we did last year in regular physics is we predicted where it should have gone, we took the measurement of where it did go, and then we could have then we could figure out the force of friction, the average force of friction of the air. And that does that's valid. You, know, you should be able to do that on AP tests if they ask you. Okay, so we did talk about the bouncing collisions really quickly in some of one of the other videos. Here are some good examples for you guys to look through in your notes with all the math there. And uh, we talked about the kinetic energy. Um, and then explosions we also talked about too very quickly. Um, but one thing that we didn't quite talk about was something a little bit different. And I, I want to take your attention to that here right now. Um, it's not that, it's not different. It's still the same, but we didn't, it's a little bit different look. So let's say this. Let's say that we have a solid wall. And we have a super ball that is going in at 10 meters per second. And let's say the mass of the super ball is M. It hits the wall. What happens when super balls hit the wall? Well, first, though, they become spring energy, right? And then they become unsprung and they bounce. And so let's say that, you know, later on, this ball is going 10 meters per second in that direction. I want you guys to tell me, why don't you tell me the, and I'll say that the time of collision here is equal to point, um, point 0.13 seconds is how long that collision lasts, okay? And then I want you to tell me what the force is. Okay, so this is what we decided that if we're not careful, we're going to think that this ball has the same momentum coming in as it does going out because it's the same mass, same velocity, right? But the thing is, momentum is a vector. So really, I have a, if I'm calling this plus 10m for momentum, then this really has to be minus 10m for momentum. And think about the change in momentum. The first change is this goes down to V equals zero. So you take away all that 10M. That, so initial momentum here is 10M, right? Final momentum here is negative 10M, right? So in order to take away this full 10M of momentum, well, then I have to have a force to do that, right? Well, there also has to be that force to be applied to get to go back to that momentum in the opposite direction. So really, you're changing the moment, momentum twice. You're changing it, you're taking away 10m, and then you're giving it 10m. So that's a total change of 20m. So if you want to look at, at the math, um, you know, you could just say, uh, force delta T is equal to a change of momentum. You know, force delta T is equal to, it's always final minus initial. So it's negative 10M minus 10M. Force delta T then equals negative 20M. Does that make sense that the force should be negative? 
Yeah, because we, we determined in the first place that positive is in this direction. The force of the wall that's going to change that momentum is going to be in the opposite direction. It happens to be that the ball puts the force, the same force on in the positive direction. Because you can't force nothing. And so then we have this, uh, you know, divided by 0.13 or whatever it was, and our force then ends up being 153.85. Newtons, which seems like quite a big force, huh? Oh, well, that's 153 times the mass. We we kind of left off the M here, but so it's a small ball. The force is much less than 153. Okay, does that make sense? But here's the question: If that happened, how in the world? And I'll tell you. This always happens, this kind of stuff always happens when you have one mass that's, you know, what do you do? Much smaller than the other mass? I don't know if that's the right math show for much, much less mass, but it could be. It is for today. Because we said that there's a conservation of momentum here, right? So if there's a conservation of momentum, our initial equals our final, our initial momentum is 10m, but apparently our final momentum is negative 20, or no, is negative 10m? That doesn't add up, so what do we do? What happened to the momentum? Did we lose that? No, we did not lose that momentum. Where is it? It's in the wall, which is attached to the ground, which is attached to everybody that's sitting around on the ground. So everybody then ends up having the other part of the momentum. So they don't have 10m. They have what? 20m. Which is really weird. Right? It's kind of weird that all of a sudden this other thing that I ran into has more momentum than I had in the first place. But that's what happens on bouncing collisions. That can happen. Does that make sense? So then the question comes, well, how about kinetic energy? Because according to this, there's free energy now. Right? Because we have kinetic energy in the beginning, one half mv squared. We have that in the beginning, right, with the super ball? And then in the end, we have the same one half mv squared of the super ball. Can you explain that then? Because this is the right physics. This is the truth. Momentum is completely 100% conserved. This is the right physics. Where is that other momentum? Any ideas? Well, the kinetic energy of the Earth is equal to one half m point zero 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 one squared. You see what I'm getting at? That makes this kinetic energy negligible because the velocity is so so small. And then you square it on top of that, which brings this kinetic energy number down to very, very, very minimal. We call it negligible. So we can still say, hey, we have a conservation of momentum and a conservation of kinetic energy. Now, you don't always have to conserve, conserve all of your kinetic energy. This would be called what kind of collision? Elastic, right? If I lost no kinetic energy, it's called elastic collision. You have to know that definition for the AP test. All the others are inelastic. And then there's two kinds of inelastic. One where they stick together, which they call perfect. And then the other one is just the loss of kinetic energy and deformation of form. Does that make sense? Are you okay with this? And I don't even know if the velocity was that big. Probably not. Okay. So maybe that will help you 
um, with your next worksheet. I do want to show you that there is another video that you can watch that will help with the next worksheet too. I made it in, in another class, but I'll post it on Moodle. Okay, thanks. thanks.